The reason indicators can be so useful if used correctly is because they present intelligence about what the underlying price action is doing. And they do it in a way that's often more usable than by looking at the raw price action alone. Visually, they present information that makes them ideal for discretionary systematic traders. But the data they provide is also much more usable by algorithms for algo traders. But indicators don't just tell us what the market is doing, they also provide clues to what the market might do next. And if we properly backtest those scenarios, we can come up with a probability-based prediction of what is most likely to happen next in different scenarios. And that's exactly what I'm going to start looking at in today's episode. And so if that sounds good, then stay tuned. In the last two episodes, I showed you a technique to firstly put yourself to the test and secondly to help you improve your working knowledge and understanding of the indicators you're using, because often we don't understand them quite as well as we think. I encourage you to take up that challenge if you haven't already. You can find links to the videos where I explain this in the description right below. But in this episode, I'm going to extend this theme so that instead of just trying to determine what the price action looks like from the behavior of the indicators, I'm going to turn my attention to looking at some of the techniques you can use to put indicators to optimal use and start making predictions of what will happen in the price action next. After all, that's why we're using indicators. Our ultimate objective is to make a probability-based prediction of where the price is going to go in the future. So let's take a look at some of the techniques that we can use to do exactly that. But before we get into the detail, I just want to take a quick look at where this episode fits in the bigger picture, and also talk a little bit about where this mini-series will be going in the future. So all of these videos that I'm producing on indicators form part of a much bigger series, and that's a series called the Algorithmic Trading for a Living series. And it was only in episode nine that I started to focus my attention on the subject of indicators. And in this, I looked at what the best practice principles are that you should always consider when using indicators, and also started to look at this from the perspective of an algo trader, and talked about the importance of range-bound indicators, and why these are so much more useful when you are an algo trader. But of course, there's an exception to break every rule, and this is the case here as well. So sometimes using indicators that aren't range bound, but instead use absolute values can sometimes be useful. And I also covered this in this particular episode. And then in episode 10, I looked at putting yourself to the test. So setting yourself this challenge to see how well you really do understand the indicators that you're already using. Then in episode 11, I looked at how you can use that same technique to help to train yourself to understand those indicators better and to interpret the information that they're giving out in a better way. And that now brings us to today's episode, which is using indicators to make probability-based predictions. Now for continuity with previous episodes, I'm going to stick with the concept of oscillators. However, note that in future episodes, I will actually be covering trend following indicators as well. So moving averages, for example, and looking for the techniques you need to use there to make them most effective. So let's now start to focus our attention on the primary uses of oscillators. And the first of those is using them as a trigger. And because triggers are point in time events, it means that they're particularly useful for telling us information about when we should be opening and closing our trades. But the second use case is one around filters. And filters are used to classify the conditions of the asset's behavior. So the underlying characteristics of the price action. 
So as an example, they could be used to identify if the price action is currently trending, and if so, in which direction. Or alternatively, it might identify that the price action is currently in a trading range. Another example is a measurement of volatility of the price action. So is that currently high or is it low? And one of the primary differences between these two things is that for triggers, this is a moment in time event, and therefore it's something that needs to be acted on immediately. But with filters, these classifications can exist for extended periods of time. And so often these two use cases are used in conjunction with each other. So you might be looking for a certain condition to be existing based on the filter, and while that condition exists, you're then looking for the trigger which gives you the fine-tuning to take the action. And in this episode, I'm going to focus on the use of indicators for this top use case, triggers. And in a future episode, I'll do the same, but for filters. So to help me explain this, I'm going to use an idealized oscillator. And this is just going to be based on a sine wave. And the reason for this is that it makes it simpler to get the concepts across. But then after this, we will look at some real price action and some real indicator values in order to put that into practice. So the first trigger point I'm going to look at is that of the indicator entering the overbought territory or the oversold territory. Now, obviously, the levels that you're going to use to define what is overbought and oversold is something that you'll have to decide for yourself. And usually, backtesting is the ideal way of finding out what those optimal values are. But once you've done this, it now presents an ideal trigger point to tell you what's happening in the market as the indicator value crosses those levels. Now, an important point here. In a real-time chart, indicator values can go into these two regions, but then within the same bar, the price can retract. And so by the time that bar's closed, the indicator value is no longer in that region. And so my personal preference when I'm using indicators is that I'll wait for a bar to close, only act on the start of the next bar, and then see if the previous bar broke the threshold of those levels or not, because by that time, the indicator values are fixed and will not change. Now, I'm not saying that you have to do that as well, but that's my personal preference. And in fact, if you've seen any of my previous episodes within the MQL coding series, you'll have heard me talk about controlling bar opening in your code. And this technique that I use with indicators goes hand in hand with that. Now, the second trigger point that I'm going to focus on is when the indicator value exits from those regions. So it goes back into neutral territory from either the overbought or the oversold regions. And again, I base my triggers on that same rule whereby I will wait for the bar to close. Now, the third trigger point that you might want to consider for some of your systems is when there's a turning point in the oscillator. So when it goes from rising to falling or falling to rising. And this is often a technique that can get you into a trade earlier than waiting for the price to exit back into neutral territory. However, it comes with a warning because this technique can cause whipsaws. So when using it, you must make sure that the probabilities are on your side that the indicator will quickly enter that neutral territory. And because of this need to ensure that the probabilities are on your side, this is where you'll often use a second indicator to tell you that fact. And only when there's agreement on the information that those two indicators are giving out would you risk this kind of entry. Because in many cases, when they don't agree, what you'll find is that there'll be a short-term turning point, but the indicator value will stay in this overbought or oversold region for a long period of time. So just be careful and make sure you backtest this technique thoroughly before you ever try to trade it in your live account. Now, the next type of trigger point that I'm going to look at is what's called an inflection point. And this is when the gradient 
of the line starts to change direction. So this technique tends to be a little bit more sophisticated in terms of the programming that you'll need to do, but it can give valuable information. And a way that I like to visualize this is similar to the relationship between velocity and acceleration. So if you understand calculus, then you'll know that one is the derivative of the other. And it's that change in the acceleration of the price action, if that's how you choose to look at this, that can also give valuable information about what's going to happen next. Now, in my experience, this tends to be a technique that's used much less frequently. But nevertheless, if you are up to the challenge of coding this and working out that gradient of the line, it's something that's certainly worth backtesting in your systems to see how effective that is. Now, in this chart, I happen to have that inflection point happening on the midway line. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. If the wave is currently in a state where there's no symmetry, then the inflection point can actually be at an alternative location. So don't just think that you can use the midpoint in order to perform this calculation. You can't. You have to actually calculate the gradient and work out when that gradient hits its own turning point. Now, the final trigger that I'm going to consider is one that uses a signal line. So many indicators tend to have signal lines, which are often nothing more than a moving average of the main line. And I find that this technique often produces a good balance. And that's a balance of getting into the market early, although not as early as the turning point that we saw before, but it does provide a little bit more certainty about where the indicator value is going. And once that cross has occurred, the probabilities have turned a little bit more in your favor in terms of going back into that neutral region. So those are the five oscillator trigger points that I'm going to concentrate on from this point forward. Now there will of course be others, and if there's another trigger point that you find particularly useful, then why not share that in the description below? And so now let's start to move on to how we might use these. So as I've said before, the whole purpose of indicators and oscillators in particular is to enable a probability-based prediction to be made about how likely a turning point is about to occur in the price action. And it's because of this that they're so useful at aiding our decision-making process in terms of giving us that event to base our trade open or our trade close on. Now, when considering which of these are most likely to be beneficial to you, you firstly need to have your system premise at the forefront of your mind. What is that premise trying to achieve? What edge is it trying to extract from the market? And the answer to those questions will inform you about which trigger type is most likely to be useful. So it's not like there's a right way and a wrong way of doing this. It really does depend on what you're trying to achieve. But hand in hand with that, it's this thorough understanding of the indicator's behavior that will also inform you of what the best technique is likely to be to meet those objectives in your system premise. So these two things really do have to be considered at the same time. Because the fact is that not all trigger types will be suitable for all system premises. So for example, there will be some that work better in a trending system, while others work much better in a mean reverting market, and likewise for breakout system strategies. And it's matching these trigger types to these different types of system that we're going to be looking at next when we look at the real charts and the real indicator information. Now, the last point here is that you should always prove your thinking and prove your intuitions with a rigorous, incremental, agile development methodology when you develop those trading systems. And again, this is something that I've talked about in previous episodes. And if you do take this incremental approach, it can mean you end up with a much more robust, effective trading system. So again, if that's something that's of interest to you, then look back at my previous episodes for the Agile development videos.
But as I said a moment ago, what we're going to focus our attention on now is matching the trigger types to these different types of trading strategy. But that brings us to the end of this episode. So you'll have to watch the next episode to see that. And if by the time you're watching this, the episode's already been released, then you'll see a link to it right here. So thanks for watching today. If you've got value, then please give me a thumbs up. And as always, I very much appreciate it when you can share a link to this video on the forums that you use and also the social media channels that you're a part of. But now until next time, trade safe.